thank you. Uh, and apologies, my talk was the first one, but you know there was for some reason we couldn't get in on time. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a workup of a case of neuroophthalmology, and uh, of course the rest of the talks are to you know follow that suit. But uh, I'm sure we're all familiar of this, so this is going to be more of a revision for all of us. This is a very simplistic presentation of the workup of a case of neuroophthalmology, and investigations will be covered in subsequent talks. So I'm just going to very briefly just mention them here. So the first thing in any case of neuroophthalmology that we have to do is the history. So the history taking is a very, very, very vital part of neuroophthalmology. So the history is a very, very important part of neuroophthalmology. And then we have the ocular examination and the systemic examination, which is almost an equal part as the ocular examination in neuroophthalmology cases. And then there are basic investigations, both ocular and systemic. In history, the commonest complaint that we get is vision loss. And so the onset of vision loss or how the vision loss is happening actually presents, you know, gives us a clue of what's happening. So if it's happening with, uh, within a few seconds to a few minutes, you're looking essentially at a vascular cause. If it's happening a little bit longer than and over a few hours, a couple of days, it's probably an inflammatory cause. And if it's happening over many months or years, then possibly the uh, you know the cause would vary, and it would go on to either degenerative diseases or uh, you know things like a uh, papilledema or NIH. So other causes for uh, or toxic neuropathies. This is over uh, many days and months of use. In the history, the very important thing, like we said, is the visual acuity. And sometimes if you don't get the visual acuity, uh, you can take a history of the visual acuity in the past by looking at the activities the patient could present or to could perform, the duration of from when that has happened, uh, what has been the episodes, has it been sudden, has, uh, has it been chronic, has it happened over time, is it transient, does it get better any time, what has been essentially the course of the illness, uh, yeah, that's important. Associated systemic histories are very important. Associated history of headache, vomiting, uh, other systemic history, family history is very important, particularly for hereditary neuropathies, uh, you know, particularly, let's say, Leber's hereditary neuropathy or other autoimmune hereditary, uh, other aut uh, autosomal dominant hereditary neuropathies. That's very important. And treatment history is very important because you need to know what the patient has previously taken in the form of medications that may be causing a toxic neuropathy or even treatment for the current condition that the person has uh, previously taken and any previous investigations that are done. So this, to a fair extent, gives you a a good idea of what the provisional or possible diagnosis could be, and then we move on to the examination. Visual acuity, as we discussed, is probably one of the most important things in neuroophthalmic examination, and you need to understand the kind of loss of vision that's happening. Uh, if at all it's happening, there are some conditions where you won't have a loss of vision, particularly in conditions which are affecting the pupil property, but then you do need to look at the near visual acuity and always make that a habit. So compare the two uh, eyes, look at the near visual acuity, look at, ask for symptoms which are talking about the quality of vision along with just the quantity of vision. So whether they're getting an appearance of a fogginess, whether there's a fade out or whether there's a change in color perception. So the quality of vision is also very, very important in such cases. Uh, in case of the uh, visual fields, so you know, generally after the visual acuity, if from the history I already have a suspicion that there's possibly could be a field defect, I actually j tend to jump straight forward to a quick confrontation fields because at that time the patient is still, uh, you know, he's fresh you can, and you can do it. And it's very important because fields actually give us a clue for a lot of diseases, you know, particularly things associated with the pituitary, things which are ischemic neuropathies. In papilledema, you get a constricted visual field. And it's probably one of the most important tests in neuroophthalmology. Uh, and this is the clinical examination part of it. So one must know how to do a good confrontation visual field. Ask the patient to occlude one eye and to look in your, uh, in the opposite eye in your, uh, on your face. You can occlude your other eye or you can keep the eyes open. For absolute defects, you can simply compare the two sides of the field or you can ask them to count fingers on the two sides, but you have to make sure that their eye looks straight. But the more traditional confrontation field will be involving, you know, when you're looking for constriction is to move from out to in and compare it with your own field. So that's the technique, but, I, but what I generally do at this stage is a quick initial confrontation to get an idea of a visual field. And it also helps the patient know that there is actually a field defect. Pupils are very important. The size of the pupils, the reaction of the pupils, a reaction to near response is very important. And you need to assess with how, whether they can dilate properly or not. So you need to do it in a lit environment, in a bright light. You need to do it in a dark room. Uh, and you always look, test the RAPD. So the, quick, uh, the pupillary pathway essentially is starting from the retina. It's going on to the ganglion cells. 
it ends up finally th through the olivary nucleus to the edinger westphal nucleus and from where the efferent pathway comes. So any problem anywhere along this pathway is going to show up in, in a, on a pupillary examination. Pupillary size is very important. This is something which is very variable. So if you do it in a bright light, you'll get a different thing. If you do it on a slit lamp, you'll see a different size. In a mesopic condition, it'll be different. So it is variable that, and there's always a change in size, alternating, which is called hippers. Usually a slight amount is there, but you can use either a simple ruler to get the size and it's particularly, you know, we are looking at anisocoria more specifically when you are looking at the pupil size. Uh, of course, both could be, uh, you know, mid dilated or both could be constricted possibly, but in anisocoria it's very important because that is pretty glaring if you look at just the size of the pupil. Pupil reactions need to be looked at with for light and for near and it's a, uh, uh, it's very, very important. I think RAPD is one of the most important pupillary signs, or in fact, one of the most important signs in neuroophthalmology, and we had a discussion of this yesterday. This is a sign you must not miss, because this is the first and the most sensitive way of saying that there's something wrong with the anterior visual pathway, particularly the optic nerves, usually. But there are other conditions for it, like retinal conditions could cause, dense amblyopia could cause, uh, you know, severe glaucoma could cause. And the right way of testing RAPD is to do a swinging flashlight test. So you ask the patient to fixate at a distant object. You're usually doing this in a relatively darkened room. You take a bright light, shine it for three to four seconds in one of the eyes, quickly swing it to the other eye. If there is a misalignment, remember you have to swing it in the visual axis, otherwise you will get a false response there. And then you can, uh, uh, you know, know which of the eyes is having an RAPD. And this is a quick, you know, uh, diagram to show the lower, the lower diagram here is showing RAPD when the lights shun here, the pupils are constricted when it shifts here, they dilate and this is against what a normal examination is. The next is of course a fundus examination, something you must do but remember don't just dilate the patients first, always check the pupillary reactions because they're going to give you a clue. There's a tendency for us to quickly move into the fundus examination but first ensure that you've seen the pupils. Uh, the best is to do a slit lamp biomicroscopy, but you also need to do an indirect ophthalmoscopy to look at the periphery. And uh, I mean, this is an ideally you should be able to also document it if you can when you find any change. The disc examination, and I'll quickly come on to this. You're looking at the size of the disc, whether the margins are clear or not. You can look at some vessels, which is called the Kestenbaum sign here. Look at the disc. Uh, you can look at the neuroretinal rim. It should be pink. It should be well-defined. It should follow the ISNT rule. But remember, this doesn't go the glaucoma way, so you will not get notching. You may get some thinning or pallor. And uh, so quickly to show some examples here. This is what a normal one would look like. Papillitis will show a hyperemic disc with blurred margins, toxic neuropathy, well-defined disc pallor. You may get in hypertensive retinopathy or papillopathy is a peripapillary uh, hemorrhage like that. You can get ischemic neuropathies. You can get uh, uh, myelinated nerve fibers that look something like this. Neuroretinitis, so you also have to examine the macula. In papilledema, you can see the disc margins are blurred. Primary optic atrophy is well-defined uh, margins, but a pale disc, secondary optic atrophy, dirty looking disc, gray, hazy margins. And in systemic examination, you have to always and always do a, a complete systemic examination and in specific, particularly the CNS examination. And in that you must do all the cranial nerves as well as all the motor system and the sensory system. Make this a, make this a habit if you want to be a successful, you know, neuroophthalmic practitioner. Uh, I think I'll leave investigations to the for, uh, coming speakers, but the ones that I'll cover which are not covered are color vision, contrast sensitivity. I do this routinely for all patients. Fields, we do an automated field and that's both a static and a kinetic and visual evoked response electrophysiology as well will be covered in the uh, subsequent talks. So I think in color vision, Ishiara's charts do well. So you're looking at a red green color vision defect, contrast sensitivity. I generally use the Perry Robson, but you can use the FACT. It's a little more sensitive for comparing, you know, in the future. Prognosis, visual fields has already been covered, so I'll skip this, but I do both kinetic and static perimetry, and both of them reveal, you know, very different things. So this is, if possible, you should be able to do a kinetic or a full field as well, but the static would, in a lot of the cases, pick up uh, field defects. Visual evoked response, very helpful to tell about the function of the anterior visual pathway, but cannot very often localize, but there are special ways in electrophysiology in which you can try and localize where exactly the lesion is lying. The OCT, again, there's a talk on OCT neuroophthalmology, will, I think will be covered there, but another useful tool in certain specific situations. So if you do have an OCT, it's definitely helpful. Systemic yeah. examinations, you need to do a hemogram, a chest x-ray in a country like India, we have to look for tuberculosis. Yeah. Very often you need to do autoimmune profiles. Uh, blood sugars need to be done, so you need to look for any systemic risk factors that are there. And okay. in special situations, can, you may need can, to do tests like syphilis.
And uh, there are lastly, yeah, this is lastly, there is some investigations that are uh, imaging or radiology investigations. Generally, between an X-ray, CT, and MRI, there are different indications, so I won't get into that. But this is just to cover the complete list. Thank you.